Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to thank Mary Emma and her co-directors uh, for putting on this workshop and for thinking about me. And I'd like to thank KU for allowing me to come and visit and eat lots of food and meet new people. I'm going to talk a little bit about how my project started and uh, then I'm going to do a, a short presentation. And this project goes back a lot further than I'd like to think. Let's just say at least a couple of decades. Um, and I see the oral history component of this project as kind of like the Energizer Bunny. It's going to continue on and on. Uh, just last night, Mary Emma gave me the names of two people in the Columbia and Augusta, in the Columbia, South Carolina, and Augusta, Georgia area. You know, must interview one being her mother. Uh, so I plan to do just that. Uh, the two people she gave me, they sound fascinating, and I can't pass up an oral interview. I'm one of those. My work deals with the experiences of Southern African American women educators during that Jim Crow era, Southern being North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia. And I look at these women for about 80 plus years. I struggle with dealing with often invisible and unappreciated uh, group, and it's based on their gender and their race. And so I use biography. Uh, and I think that's the best method of trying to get down to the real nitty gritty details about their lives and to answer some of the questions I want uh, to get answered. And so oral interviews also help me. Uh, I started doing oral interviews in 1987. That was my first oral interview. And I was interested in writing a paper about uh, an all black school, the all black school that I went to. And so I, I planned for it to be my MA thesis. And so I went to interview the first principal of that school. He had uh, retired. And I went to his house to, to talk to him. And I planned to spend a couple of hours. I left work at lunchtime, made the, you know, I made the appointment, spend, planned to spend a couple of hours. And what happened that day was I ended up spending the entire afternoon and having dinner with them. And I changed my focus of my research project. It was no longer the all-black school that I, I was still interested in the all-black school, but my focus shifted to the women. And the reason my focus shifted was Mr. Nixon uh, said, I'm not the interesting one. Now, he was, but he looked at me and said, I'm not the one who's interesting. It's really my wife. And I thought, but your wife was not the principal of the all-black schools. You know, I'm wrestling with my southern manners here. And so I go into the house and he says, you have to interview my wife. Well, I have to interview his wife. So we go into the back of the house and she had had a stroke. And my mind is saying, this is not good. And so we start the interviewing process and he was absolutely correct. She was fascinating. And part of it was her ability to speak um, had been changed since the stroke. And so she would say something if I didn't understand it, she tried to repeat it, then he would try to uh, tell me what she was saying. If he didn't get it right, she would shake her head and we'd start all over again. It was one of the most fascinating evenings I, I had in any of my interviews that, I, that I've done. Uh, and again, she shifted my focus to look at the black women and what their roles were uh, in providing an education for African Americans during that Jim Crow era. I grew up in an extended family uh, with a grandmother, a great-grandmother, a mom, stepfather, lots of uncles and nieces. And my great-grandmother would often take me with her to visit uh, the old folks in the community. And so those are my earliest, my earliest memories. And I'm still fascinated with old folks. No matter how old I get, I'm still fascinated with old folks. And I keep moving it up the older I get. Um, I'm going to share a little bit with you about my methodology. I think that's, I think it's important. Um, it's similar to other people's methodologies. Uh, Leon Dash, who is a journalist, I borrow stuff. I'm one of those. Um, I prefer to interview my subjects more than once, three to four times at least. I have some I've interviewed seven and eight times. Uh, but part of the reason that I prefer to interview them more than once is it takes you that long to gain trust. And for me, I need to gain trust because I'm interested in getting as close to the truth as I possibly can get. You're never going to get absolute truth. I understand that as a historian, but I need to get as close as I possibly can get. 
Uh, the dilemma in doing oral interviews is that it reminds you of Langston Hughes's uh, phrase that he coins, the tunis. You also get that with interviews. Uh, there's there's a, uh, a public mask that we all wear. There's, there's a certain image we want people to see. There are images we don't want people to see. And I need the people I'm interviewing, I need them to voluntarily remove that mask. And that takes a lot of time. Um, if you're doing interviews, for those of you who are planning to start uh, interviews, your eyes, your inflection, they all give it away. And so you have to be very, very careful when you're doing uh, oral interviews because people can see right through you. So if you're one of those, you know, your facial expressions tell everything, you too need to don a mask uh, because you really do want to get that, that, that truthful information from them. I'm also interested in any one story to help me prevent an accurate picture. One of my earliest interviews about black education uh, started out with the janitor of an all-black school. Um, Mr. Bullock, and I got a story that I wouldn't have gotten from a teacher or anybody else. That story could have only been told by Mr. Bullock. And so I went into the school and, and I had set up an appointment to talk to him. And I was interested in that time period when DSEG happened because I'm interested in knowing what are the differences? What are the different experiences my teachers, uh, what was different about the Jim Crow period and the DSAG period? So I went in and I talked to Mr. Bullock and he said that, uh, he said, I'll tell you a story. And he said, when this Little River School, the school that I was interested in in the beginning, we went home for Christmas and the uh, New Year's break and we came back to a different school. So. DSEG happened over the holiday break. He got a phone call from the school system, some one of the top administrators. I don't know whether it was the superintendent or what. He couldn't remember who called him. But he was told to change every bathroom seat. And that was my impression, that was my expression too. Mm. And I said, okay, help me to understand this because it just baffled my mind that he had been asked to do this. And he laughed and he said, didn't make much sense, did it? And I said, no, it didn't make much sense. It was only later that I was able to make some connections. You, you grow with interviews. And what, ha what happened was um, it helped me to understand the mindset of at least of that system and to know that it probably was in other systems as well in that this school is now going to be it was an all-black school it's now going to be a mixed school we do not want white bottoms hitting seats that black students seat bottoms had been on just that basic uh, that that raw idea about the other person that helped me understand what kind of system my teachers were working under um, but it also helped me to understand the craziness of Jim Crow, uh, the craziness of segregation, because the school's going to be desegregated and some more black seats are going to hit that bottom. But who said Jim Crow was a logical system? It's not a logical system. So it helps me play with those kinds of, of, of crazy things that are happening within the system. Another thing that helped me with my oral interviews, uh, and as I said, I grow with, with each one. Sometimes I never go to an interview with a set group of questions. That's just not how I interview people. I allow them pretty much to lead the interview. Their answers to some of my first questions, uh, their responses, the kinds of things they want to talk about, prompt me to ask certain questions and that's how I start my interviews off. One of the ways that this method helps me is that over time I'm allowed to pick and or select material that seem disconnected but now there's a connection and I can make those connections and I'll give you an example. I interviewed the second principal of this high school and his wife Mrs. Cherry, Mr. and Mrs. Cherry and one of the comments Mrs. Cherry made to me was about committee men. In the educational system, uh, the early on educational system, we're talking late 19th, early 20th century, 
committee men decided who would be teachers, how long they would teach, and every year they looked at their, their contracts. And every year, teachers had to also take an exam. So she's talking about committee men, and she ends it by saying, lots of sexual favors were requested. None of my other teachers had talked about this, and, they, and by this time I had been doing lots of interviews. None of them had talked about this subject. And she said, that's information for you to take and figure out what to do with it. Okay, so I stored it in the back because now I can go on and I can start talking to teachers and see if they will share some more information with me. I interviewed later on a woman by the name of Mrs. Robinson and she talked about her grandmother who had been a teacher and her grandmother traveled around in a buggy. This would have been the late 19th century and her mode of getting from school to school was horse and buggy. And she made the comment that her grandmother never used the bathroom sitting down. She always stood up. And that they found it funny as children because they wanted to know how she did that. So they went around when washing was done, checking out her drawers. Had a split in them, okay? And I'm sitting there, you know, this is real interesting and I'm chuckling as well because I'm thinking, you know, this is cute. This is kind of interesting. Now what do I do with this, all right? And so that story went to the back, along with my earlier story. And then I got to Justine Washington, whom, I, whom I'm going to talk about a little later in the PowerPoint presentation. And Justine told me a story. And Justine's story was that by now Justine is traveling, her traveling mode is car. And she's on her way in the backwoods of Aiken, South Carolina, from one location to another, and you've got to picture rural areas, because I'm looking at rural school teachers, there are no lights, we're talking dark. And she's on her way uh, somewhere, and she is uh, stopped by a group of white males. And they tell her that her, flat, that her tire is going flat, and if she'll get in the car with them, they will take her to the next house. She recognizes immediately the danger she's in, and she says, sure, just let me get my purse. She has left her car running. She jumps in her car and takes off. It clicks. All three of these stories deal with sexual dangers. Mrs. Robinson's grandmother stands up to use the bathroom because she is in a rural area and she needs to see her surroundings at all times. She can't even squat. All right. Small but important and significant if I want to know the nitty-gritty daily details of these women's lives and what they experience and how they change over time. The sexual harassment tells me that the first Mrs. Cherry told me about tells me something about what kind of experience you have when every year your job is determined by somebody else. Every year. There is no tenure. Somebody else gets to decide whether you're hired or not. So I'm interested in finding out how do these women protect themselves? What kind of things do they do to make sure that they avoid these kinds of situations, all right? We know about domestics. We have stories of young girls being sent, black girls being sent into homes with razor, straight razors to protect themselves. I want to know what do professional women do? How do you protect yourself? And so these are the kinds of issues that allow me to ask questions that I, know I wouldn't have thought of if I had made out a list of questions. They would not have been at the top of my list or probably not even on my list. My first question is usually factual stuff, material I can check. What's your name? How old are you? Um, where were you born? Who are your parents or your guardians? Uh, who are your siblings? Where do you fit into that group? That's just giving me a little background information on them, getting them comfortable with the conversation. I then ask them, what's your earliest memory of school? You see, my questions are pretty vague. What's your earliest memory? I'm interested in tapping into that to see what that tells me about that particular person. I then go on, what's your earliest mem memory of your family, your earliest childhood memory growing up? What do you remember about that? Church, what do you remember about growing up in church? And then outside of the family, peer relations, what are your earliest memories of your best friend? Um, right up to childhood. And again, when I ask what is your earliest memory of school, that leads on to more questions. 
be, or any of these, because if I ask what's your earliest memory of school, then they're probably going to give me that first grade. And then I prompt them to go as far as they went to school. That also allows me to, to make them comfortable. I don't say, did you graduate from college? That's irrelevant. I want to take them as far as they went, and that's all I need to know. So those are the kinds of methods that I use uh, to help people be comfortable with me interviewing them. I also love interviewing siblings and friends of my subjects. Nothing makes people happier than telling secrets on each other. <laughs> Even when they've sworn an oath, I will not tell. What they do is they swear you to an oath. And you have, to, you know, as a historian uh, and as the, as, as the professional in this, I do have to, to, to keep secrets. And I, I have some secrets, and, and they will go with me to my grave. But they want to share those secrets. And I'll, I'll give you an example of one. I interviewed a woman in Georgetown, South Carolina, named Minnie Kennedy. Minnie is 92 years old now and just spry, active, says whatever. You know, she's at that age where she can say anything and everything. I think Minnie was always like that, though. And she's one of those people I love interviewing over and over again. Um, I interviewed Minnie about her uh, memories of growing up on Baruch uh, Plantation uh, in that Georgetown area, Bernard Baruch. And so I had established a really good relationship with many, and then I ended up interviewing a gentleman about the same area, same time period. And he talked about Mr. Vanderbilt. He had been Mr. Vanderbilt's personal valet. And he talked about the fact that Mr. Vanderbilt had gave him land when he decided to develop a certain part of the land that blacks had lived on, swampy area, you know, temperature, things have changed now. You got air condition, you can do all sorts of things, get rid of mosquitoes, all those things. And so Mr. Vanderbilt wanted that land to be developed, and it's very pricey land. Uh, we're talking million and a half dollar homes in this particular area. But first you need to get the black folks off of it. So this gentleman had a very fond memory of Mr. Vanderbilt and a, very, and, and a memory of, of things going very smoothly. And for me, something just didn't ring quite right. It's that go with your gut. Uh, I, if I can give no other advice, go with your gut and figure out another way to find the answer to what your gut is telling you. And so I let him tell his story because that is his truth, and I have to take that at face value. And then I went to Minnie, and I said, Minnie, tell me about Debbie Doo. That's the name of the development place. And Minnie said, what do you want to know about Debbie Doo? And so I said, well, Mr. So-and-so-and-so told me that this is what happened. I could relay his story. There was, there was nothing about it that couldn't be relayed. And Minnie laughed, and she said, oh, he's just lying through his teeth. So Minnie goes on to tell me what really happened at Debbie Doo, and even had a friend whose grandfather had been killed. And she was able to, her friend was able to show me um, the coroner's report, newspaper articles, a couple of newspaper articles were made. And what had happened was everybody didn't want to move, and this one particular person didn't want to move. Um, and he was killed, and then everybody moved. But I had gotten a totally another picture. So oral interviews, sometimes you have, to back, you have to back up and check another source. If something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right, and you need to check another source. Now, both stories, when I talk to my students, I say, now, which story do I believe? Both stories are true. His story is true because Mr. Vanderbilt, had they had a very close relationship. And Mr. Vanderbilt worked lots of things out for him. Bought land, started his business, built him a house. He runs a barbecue place. Mr. Vanderbilt did those things for him. On the other hand, the gentleman who died, that's another real story. Both of those stories tell me, get me closer to the truth as to what happened. All right? Some moved off peacefully. Others were forced off. That's how I use oral interviews. Let's talk a little bit about the women uh, that I'm working on. And I focus on five women, my research, my biographical analysis are with five women. But I bring in lots of other women, and I bring in men, and I do oral, as I said, I do oral interviews with anybody and everybody who will allow me to see something that I probably wouldn't be able to see in written text to help me read between the lines, shall I say, to help me compare, contrast their lives. Um, 
In, 19, in the 1930s, Charles Hamilton Houston persuaded a skeptical NAACP that the Achilles heel of Jim Crow was the education system. By 1954, his strategic plan for a legal attack resulted in the overturning of Plessy. Throughout the Jim Crow era, one of the things I argue is that Southern African American women school teachers also saw the educational foundation as a point of attack, and they developed tactics and created foundations to help dismantle that same oppressive system. Their efforts set in motion preconditions, such as promoting broader civic engagement for the success of the legal movements that happened later, like Brown versus Board of Education. They also supported organized collective movements, such as health and social welfare initiatives. And I argue that the modern civil rights era emerges out of a series of micro political struggles in which women were the vanguard. And I would argue that my teachers are one of many groups. There are certainly other groups. So let's talk about some of these women. And then I promise to save uh, time for questions. All right. Well, maybe we won't talk about these women. We'll do it the hard way. This is Annie Wealthy Dorothy Holland. She's the first woman I uh, started research on. She basically, like many of the others, fell in my lap. Um, she was born in Isle of Wight County, Virginia in, 1880, um, in 1865. She started teaching in 1884, and she taught until she dropped dead in 1934. She was actually giving a lecture when she uh, died. She's one of two Jean's teachers I examined, and Jean's teachers were um, Southern. In a way, you could consider them de facto superintendents for the black schools. Uh, Anna Jean's was a Quaker in Pennsylvania. She gave a million dollars in 1908 uh, to start the Jean's fund. And the first Jean's teacher was Virginia Randolph. And much of it is modeled after Virginia Randolph's work. She involves the church, the community, those kinds of things. And these women basically were told to do whatever they could to educate the community. Whatever it took, just do it. Um, and so in essence, they become superintendents. They rove around. They last from 1908 to 1968, and then they become what we call now curriculum uh, instructors. Justine Washington is the second Jean's teacher I look at. And I'm going to talk more about her interviews uh, today. But Justine was born in 1908 in Atlanta, Georgia. And she served as a Jean's teacher in Aiken County, South Carolina, from 1936 to 1959. Uh, the first one, Annie, served in North Carolina, by the way. This is Mary Pauline Fitzgerald Dane, and she literally fell in my lap. I was, I had read a book by Pauline Mary called Proud Shoes. If you haven't read it, it's a fascinating little book um, with Pauli Murray, who was one of the co-founders of the National Organization of Women. She was a lawyer. She worked with Thurgood Marshall, uh, a very active woman. She was one of the first African-American Episcopal priests, um, and has a fascinating history at, in Chapel Hill with UNC. Her white ancestors, uh, both Polly and, and Mary Pauline's, own the land, own part of the land now that UNC Chapel Hill is on. And when Polly Murray attempted to get into UNC, they told her no, because she was African American. Well, never mind that her great grandfather had donated part of the land. But Polly Murray uh, taught for 61 years. None of the five women I look at taught for less than 50 years. They teach an average of 55, but this one taught for 61 years. So her letters, her poetry, uh, all give me a very clear picture of who Polly Murray was. And I gave a talk one day at, uh, at the Durham County Library, and I looked in the back, and there were six or seven women in the back with hats on, uh, dressed to the nines. And when I finished 
my talk on Pauli Murray, they stood up and said, we're the class of 1950. And I went, okay. And uh, they went on to tell me some more stories about Pauli and that they thought I had done a pretty good job of describing Pauli Murray. That was the highest honor I could have gotten, that those women saw Pauli in my work. I am big on theory, but I'm also big on making sure that you see the people, that you understand that they were living human beings. And I think oral histories just allow us to do that. Um, but Pauli Murray was one of those people who, um, she was born in 1871, uh, and she taught in Durham County, North Carolina. She also taught in Virginia. Um, her marriage, she got married, I say, late in life. Uh, she was in her early, her late 20s, or she was around 30 years old when she got married. Marriage ended because her husband was a lawyer, couldn't find work, looked white. Polly also looked white. And he wanted her to pass, and she decided she couldn't do that. So the marriage ended, and uh, she writes poetry about that. And if you did not know that the marriage ended because he decided to pass, uh, you would think that uh, he took on a mistress. So it's very interesting to see how she couched it. I also interviewed several of her cousins who helped me understand uh, other stories about members of the family passing back and forth. But Polly never passed. Um, this is another picture of Mary Pauline with some of her students. And this is a 1910 photograph. This is Charlotte Hawkins Brown. And most people know Charlotte Hawkins Brown as the founder for Parma uh, Memorial Institute. Um, Brown is one of those women that has been written about. Her home is a national historic is on the National Historic Register. There's a museum uh, in North Carolina on her. She was born in 1883 in Henderson, North Carolina, but she grew up in Massachusetts, and she comes back to North Carolina. Uh, the AMA brings her back to North Carolina to start a school. And she establishes the school in 1902, and it's, it's called Palmer Memorial Institute. And it's known from 1927 to 1955 as the premier Negro finishing school in America. It still gets letters asking, is it open from uh, former students in Africa and all over the world? It, it was that great of a school. I'm interested in Charlotte Hawkins Brown's outreach. I'm interested in her forming a, uh, starting a home for wayward girls uh, through the national, uh, through the North Carolina Federation of Negro Women. The pattern I'm seeing is that the school teachers often uh, were also the leaders in, in the state uh, federations, and they do other things with students. And so Charlotte is one of those women who starts a home for wayward girls. South Carolina does the same thing. Virginia. So there are there are those patterns. I'm also interested in Charlotte forming a land co-op. I was able, through an oral interview, to track down a deed uh, that was made in 1908, and it's still in the family, uh, based on Charlotte's land co-op. So those are the kinds of things I'm interested in. I'm not just interested in the teachers teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. I'm interested in all sorts of things that they did. But that's Miss Charlotte. These are the areas that, uh, the kinds of things that helped me understand what my teachers uh, were dealing with. And as you can tell, this is, a, this is an African-American school. This is the outhouse here. And from an oral interview, I was able to understand that this is a drainage area where trash and all sorts of other stuff went. This is the white school, same area, same time period. Another photograph of an African-American school. This is a training school that's built so many of my many of the genes teachers would have been involved in fundraising and getting schools like this built for the African Americans during that Jim Crow period. This was an older school. Part of their function would also have been to revitalize areas. And so this is a photograph of before and after. areas they're working in, these, these rural areas. I think sometimes we forget to, th to think about uh, you know, who are they dealing with, what areas are they dealing with. 
And this, this is, we're talking rural, we're talking people who have the, just sometimes not even the basics, as you can tell by the housing. These are some of their students they would have had, who probably would have much rather been out playing, fishing with grandpa and, and their dad. This one helps me understand um, county commencements. Um, one of the things that, in several of my interviews, former teachers and students talked about county commencements. And this is graduation. And it's elementary graduation. This isn't a high school graduation. We're talking elementary graduations here. Um, this is a parade that's being held at a particular um, commencement exercise. They go on for two to three days. All right. So this is somebody leading this uh, commencement exercise. Bands. These are people in, uh, in wagons coming. This particular county commencement, it's raining and there is a line as far as you can see. People coming, trying to get into the building where, and you can see people here, where the students are exhibiting their work. Another photograph of a county commencement. Look at the dress. Another one, marching down the streets. Again, look at the dress. And the numbers, the sheer numbers. This is an exhibit. This would have been a jeans teacher uh, who would have been exhibiting materials from uh, their students had made, chairs where they had covered uh, linen wear. These are pine cone hats, by the way, and I would wear one of them gladly now. I think they're just darling. But the students, the girls, they had won prizes for their pine cone hats they had made uh, during the year. Another one of uh, all sorts of things that the students have made from baskets. Uh, you can just find all sorts of things along these walls that they're exhibiting. Another photograph of crowds going to a county commencement. And this is another one of, uh, you can just see numbers. They're packed into this place to hear a speaker. Now, the speaker might have talked about health issues. They might have talked about uh, farming, new farming uh, methods. Students may have given a talk, uh, an oral uh, presentation, reciting poetry. All of my oral interviews tell me the kinds of things that they would have done at these county commencements. And I just, you know, part of it, I, I find these things fascinating because it helps me understand what is it like going to school during this time period? What are some of the things the teachers have to do to make sure this works? Now, county commencements, when you think about county commencements, the numbers can range anywhere from a few hundred, I've seen numbers up to 20, 25,000. Because the entire neighbor, all the neighborhoods come to these county commencement. What does that tell me about the value of education and how much these people are valuing education during that time? Because again, this isn't high school or college. These are elementary students that they're coming out to see. So those are the kinds of things that I talk that I that I look at. I just want to share a couple of things from Justine. Um, and and again, I want to save room for question and answers. When she arrived in Aiken County, um, one of the things that she was told was that here are the here the she she met with the uh, superintendent and the superintendent looked at her and said well there are 84 schools this is justine talking to me and she says uh the principal told her nine of the schools have three teachers each there are 22 two teacher schools and 53 one teacher schools and he tells her you will be in charge of those schools and I want you to do a good job. And then he looks at her and he says, and I'm sorry I don't have anyone to go show you where those schools are. And with that, she's left to her own devices. 
Welcome to Aiken, South Carolina. So Justine, being the innovative person that she is, or was, well, she died a few years ago uh, at the age of 92, uh, Justine teamed up with um, a couple of people, the nurse, the community nurse, uh, and she traveled around to find, the, to find those, school, those 84 schools. And as I said, she stayed there for quite some time and did quite well. Um, here's Justine telling me about her experiences early on. She says, the superintendent had a supervisor or two and a few other people in his central office, but as far as the black seg segment of the school system, I was that person. We now have guidance services. For those schools, I was the guidance person. We have a special education program. We had to network with the county nurse to get her to help and get services. We now have truant officers. I had to do that. We have adult education programs. The state appointed me the supervisor of adult education in Aiken County. And she even told me a story about when African American students finally got buses, it was Justine's job to follow the bus from place to place in case it broke down, and then she would go back and call and say, the bus is broken down somewhere. You need to get somebody out here to pick up the student. So they really were a jack of all trades. Innovation. Justine helped me understand some of the innovative uh, ways that teachers taught with little of nothing. Wilkerson worked with teachers. She cut and pasted materials together to help the students learn to read and write. To compensate for lack of math, another teacher I interviewed, Lola Salas, had our students make dollhouses which required mathematical computations. She also used magazines and newspapers to teach reading. Another teacher taught row, row, row your boat, and when the saints go marching in, using Coke bottles and water. You put a certain amount of water into Coke bottles, you get a certain musical note. Didn't know that, but I learned that through that oral interview. Discipline was one of those areas that I also learned about with my teachers. Uh, some of them talked about women um, whipping boys like men. Now that kind of shifts us from thinking about the role of a professional, the role of a woman. You, know, you don't think of women as whipping boys like men or being manly and whipping somebody. Uh, you know, you send the little children out, you close the door, and you go at it because this big kid has not been acting right. So it tells me something about the time period, it tells me something about the culture, that gender and race sometimes uh, dovetail and, and, and sometimes one outranks the other. Um, those are the kinds of things I find fascinating about uh, looking at, at those areas. Justine talks about her job was to supervise teachers. And so she gets to a school one day and she finds two teachers arguing loudly, one accusing the other of taking her boyfriend. That happened too. She informed them that they were there to teach, not to argue. And the possibility of such conflicts were factored into regulation, regulations that the Jeans teachers were supposed to follow. Wilkinson was not allowed to date within her school district. Like other Southern women, she was to remain morally upright and her dating would have possibly created some problems like the two teachers arguing over one particular male. Her future husband, Isaiah or Ike Washington, pretended he was visiting the family she boarded with in Aiken um, and that's how they courted. They married in 1942 and at the time he was a principal in Augusta. This was, uh, and so they had a commuting marriage, like some of my other teachers had commuting marriages. So I'm able to glimpse at you know, how do you work this out when your husband's one place and you're another place. They seem to have done quite well. The marriages didn't end. Uh, for at least two of them, one did. Uh, but those are the kinds of things I'm interested in. How do you make something work while you're trying to teach people? Uh, and how does that fit into your philosophy of education? So those are some of the areas that, that I look at. Justine was, all of the teachers were fascinating. Justine was, is one of the most fascinating teachers I've interviewed and probably because I interviewed her the most. She told me the most stories. Her memory would, you know, you jar the memory and they just come flooding out. And I'm gonna end with just one um, 
one note and then we'll, we'll go to questions. She told me the story of driving Miss Daisy. She told me lots of stories, but one sticks out and it was called Driving Miss Daisy. How many of you have seen Driving Miss Daisy? Well, Justine described her experience as driving Miss, da Miss Daisy, and the experience was the two trustees uh, or committee men responsible for the system in Aiken. Uh, Justine was to go around with them and visit the other committee men. Now, these are two white males. Justine is to sit in the back of the car. They get to the house of the other trustee. Justine is to remain in the back of the car. The two men get out, they go to the door, get the other trustee, bring him out, then they open the door for Justine, she gets out and they transact business standing out there. She calls it driving Miss Daisy. The reason she calls it driving Miss Daisy is all those manners involved in racial etiquette. She cannot go to the front door because she is an African American woman in a Jim Crow South. But at the same time, the men open the door and help her out because she is a woman. Some contradictions here. But if at any time Justine doesn't follow one of those unwritten rules, she's the loser. The school loses. Her system loses. And she understands that. And so I look at how these women work within a system to change things. And Justine and those other women allow me to do that. Justine talked about, um, I'll end with just one of, her say, one of her many sayings. Your attitude determine your longitude and your altitude. You don't stop because you don't have everything you want. You take what you have and you do the very best you can do. Put your best foot forward, your chin up, and keep moving on. And I think that epitomizes these teachers better than anything else I could have said. Thank you so much. Questions? You didn't all go to sleep at one time. Questions? best. I'm a little short here. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about what you did in terms of conducting your interview and your interview to guide you. But what I kept thinking about is of all the interviews you've done, what compelled you to pick these five women for your story? Partly what convinced me to select the five materials, what was available, some of them fell in my lap, like Mary Pauline literally fell in my lap. I had read Pauline Murray's book, and I was in the Durham County uh, School Board uh, system reading their board minutes from the early 18, 1800s. And I saw a notation that said, M.F. Fitzgerald, hired. And then it listed some other teachers. And I said, M.F. Fitzgerald, could this be M.P. Fitzgerald? could this be Mary Pauline? And it was Mary Pauline. Um, she actually was hired at the age of 15. She put up her hair and pretended that she was a little older. Uh, but it's not unusual to find those teachers being hired at 15 and 16 years old. And Pauline was one of those. And so that started me looking at Mary Pauline. Um, Annie, well, Annie Holland uh, was a jeans teacher, and I was looking around for a jeans teacher, and the North Carolina archives had N.C. Newbold, who was a state agent for Negro education, kept everything. And so he had real good records of that time period. Uh, and then I went to Virginia, did some digging. That was her home. Um, went to the church. The church pastor introduced me to the mortician and his wife. Um, I missed her granddaughter by about three years. But the mortician's wife had been given Annie Holland's uh, chair, favorite chair, and had been given a plate. So she was able to tell me stories about that she had received from uh, her best friend, who had been the granddaughter of Annie Holland. So part of it is I kept pulling threads and finding stuff. 
Justine, again, somebody early on knew I was interested in teachers at South Carolina. I was at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and he sent me a stack of oral interviews that someone had done, one of his former students had done with Jean's teachers in South Carolina. And here's this oral interview of Justine Washington. And I'm reading it and I'm like, they didn't let her talk. They didn't ask the right questions. I want to know so much more about this woman. And I'm looking at the date and I'm saying, she's dead. I know she's dead. I'm, you know, craziness. But, you know, you make these assumptions. And I did, based on what I was looking at. One of my advisors, Jim Anderson, went to Augusta, Georgia for, to give a talk. He came back with an audio tape, and there was Justine Washington. I thought, oh yeah, I'm on my way to Georgia. Um, hopped a plant, called, talked to her, got the introductions. She said, come on down. I don't know how much I can, she, I can tell you, you know, but come on down. Uh, got a plane to Atlanta, cheap ticket to Atlanta. Uh, rented a car, stayed with a friend in Atlanta, and interview, and that started my interview with Justine and her husband Ike. Uh, and so over the next 10 years, I was back and forth to Justine's house interviewing her. Justine turned me on to other teachers, uh, Mrs. Gresham, I couldn't interview in person, but I got to interview her over the telephone several times. And a lot of times it just snowballed. Uh, Charlotte Hawkins Brown was interesting. People had written about her, but nobody had focused on her starting a home for wayward girls. And I saw the connection between Virginia and South Carolina, and nobody had talked about her land co-ops. They hadn't followed those nitty-gritty details to figure out. It was just a rumor that she'd started a land co-op. And so I was able to go to the courthouse and follow up on some oral interviews that had been done. Uh, so that's how I ended up with these women. That's a long way of answering your question. I promise not to be that long on the next one. Yes. I'm curious about the mechanics of your interview. You said you came in with some basic questions mm -hmm. that could be verified, and then you allowed them to tell their story, and from there you developed your questions. But did you use an audio tape? Did you take notes? Did you, did you have? That's what I want to know. Good. I actually, I audio tape. Um, do we have three minutes and I can just show you the beginning of, of how I do one? Hopefully, let's see. No, I do not allow them to edit it. And as soon as I can find this little, uh, I can't get my, hmm. All right, why isn't this reading my hand? It is, but I can't get the, uh, there it is. It's coming. Uh, I do not allow them to edit. Um, that's just a preference. Um, I want the raw material. I don't want them to fix it up. I do allow them to, um, to add, you know, if they remember something else. So that is a form of editing, but I, I keep all of the interviews uh, separate and then I go back and look. And part of that is to go back and look for contradictions. That's when you know that mask is coming off, and that's a good thing, uh, because then you can, you can start uh, making some comparisons and you can go back and say, you know, I don't go back and say, now you said such and such the last time and you said this this time. I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm interested in them um, matching the two, but I'm not blaming them for contradicting themselves because sometimes people remember things and then they add things. Uh, so I do that. All right, let's see if this will. I'll just play a little portion of this. This is an interview I did with a woman, and you'll see me prompt her a couple of times. Now that's because when I went in and the other person was setting up the video. Right. Would you tell us your full name, including your maiden name first? Uh, Cecilia Osborne Johnson McGee. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what year and month and day were you born? Uh, September the 17th, 1911. And where were you born? In Aiken, South Carolina. And tell me your parents' name. Uh, Cecilia Elizabeth Natterby's Johnson, and my father's uh, Charles Catlett Johnson, Sr. Okay. And what did your father and mother do? Uh, my father was a 
second black doctor in Aiken. Came to Aiken around 1904. And my mother was a housewife, but she did help in it. My father uh, had a drugstore, so she helped in the drugstore. Okay. And your father came from where? Uh, Orange County, Virginia. And your mother was born where? Augusta, Georgia, on Randall Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. And sisters and brothers, how many sisters and brothers? Did mm, you I had six sisters and brothers. And where did you fit in that number? Uh, I was the fifth, fifth child. And what's your first memory of school? Uh, well, uh, going with a slate and with a primer. Going to school with a, yeah. So yeah. describe a slate for me. Uh, See how prompting Well, you ha they have slates now, but uh, I don't think they use them. In fact, they don't use them in school. But uh, they had, we had a, a pencil that we would write on the slate. We didn't write with crayon, it was, we wrote with a pencil. And uh, we first had to go in Prima. And I was six years old when I started in Prima. Uh, instead of going in the kindergarten, in those days they called it Prima. It was a red book that had uh, two children in it. And the way I can remember, one was, the boy was named Ned and the girl was named Nell. And we were, in a building where there was a third grade class that was held by Mrs. Mosley, and my teacher was a Mrs. Smith. And uh, uh, we just remember, I, I can't remember too much about it, but I do remember the children in the third grade would be getting lickings from the teacher because they would be misbehaving. But we were little, so uh, it, it, we didn't get many uh, thrashings during those days. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your sisters. So tell me about your sister starting school with you. Uh, I was six uh, that September, and my sister was four. And uh, my mother wanted my sister to start with her, but the teacher said that she was too young. So my mother said if she couldn't go to school, then I wouldn't be able to start. So then the teacher decided they would let her come, and uh, we'd be in class together. And uh, we were, she, uh, she uh, we could read as well as I could. Whatever I could do, she could do it. But at the end of the year, they said that she was too young to promote, so they left her back, and I went on to first grade. All right. So describe first grade for me. Mm, first grade, I had a lady named Miss Mrs. Emma Connor. You see how I go? And I'm I remember this. just remember so well. Uh, uh, we had, we began to use. Okay. You see how I go back and forth? I just, I allow them to, as much as possible to carry the conversation, and I just insert questions and, and move them the way I want them to go. Hopefully that's what I'm doing. Sometimes I, you know, if I get a mini Kennedy, I may not be moving anybody because Minnie's going to talk about what she wants to talk about and you just go with the flow because you're getting such great information. It doesn't matter. You'll figure out how to use it. And we have time for another question, for a couple more questions. I actually have a couple questions. Okay. <laughs> One is practical. How do you spell genes? J-E-A-N-E-S. Genes. Okay. And her and name is, was... Is there any... Um, any books or articles that have come out on the Gene Scholars? You know, there are several articles uh, that are out on the Genes Teachers. If you do a Google search for J-E-A-N-E-T, Genes, that's, mm -hmm. that's her name, uh, or Genes Teachers in the South, you, you'll crop up with some. Uh, and there are people still doing work on Genes Teachers. Um, there was a 1935 book published on, on the Genes Teachers, but nothing else has been done, no, nothing big like a book has been done since that time, so it's, it's time. And then the other, the other question I have is, when you showed the photographs of the children and what they had done, mm -hmm. that just made me wonder, were the teachers, the black teachers, women teachers in the South teaching primarily technical skills, or was it also read and write and arithmetic? They taught all of those things. I get a good cross, which is you know one of that myth that you know, they're only learning industrial education. Well, industrial education is, is a funny creature. Uh, Mrs. McGee talks about learning Latin and algebra and all those other subjects. 
Uh, and I get other teachers talking about that as well from their childhood memories of the kinds of things that they took in classes. Industrial education is certainly a component of many of most of the black schools during this time period because that's what they say you need to do. But as Charlotte Hawkins Brown argues that she's teaching industrial education, you're in a rural area, you know when somebody's coming to visit you. They never sneak up on you. So you would be taking Latin and algebra and trigonometry and somebody's coming to see you and you pull out the washboard and you pull out the iron and you're doing industrial education, okay? Now, they also take industrial education and use it to raise money for the schools. So the students in, in many cases are building, growing, growing gardens, selling canned foods, um, learning how to take care of uh, you know, pigs and chickens and those kinds of things, and they sell them and that money is pumped back into the African American schools. So they do use a component of, of industrial education, but I argue they use it to circumvent Jim Crow. Thank you very much.